to a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Hello there! Welcome to another episode of A Captain's Log. We are the premier Star Trek talk show with news and interviews. Your one-stop source for everything Star Trek, plus the people in front of and behind the camera that you want to hear from. I'm in my quarters by myself today as Lily is on a special mission on Cestus 3. Computer, open a subspace channel to Lily Fox Lim down on the planet surface Cestus 3. Priority 1. Howdy, BK. Nice of you to call in. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lily. How is your mission going? Anything new that you can tell us? BK, you know it's top secret and I can't reveal anything. Yes. But it is going great so far. Thought I'd try, Lily. Please tell our viewers about our guests coming up here on A Captain's Log. On today's show, we have a fabulous guest for you guys. He is the one and only Dan Curry. Wow, Dan Curry, he was very important for the Star Trek series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. Yeah, for sure. I can't wait to talk to him. He was influential in helping with the creation of the Klingons, along with Michael Dorn, who played Worf, and the Star Trek writers, of course. Lily! Can you teach me advanced Klingon so I am fluent in the language? Raj, I've already taught you some basics of the Klingon language. It's quite a commitment if you want to learn Klingon or any language fluently. Oh, yes. We've had the creator of the Klingon language, Mark Oakrand, on the show, as well as some Klingon warriors such as Robert O'Reilly and J.G. Herzler. I should learn more considering the Klingon Empire is so vast and robust with honorable interviews we will have next season. Sure, Raj. Well, today we have quite a Klingon connection as well with our interview guest. What sentence would you like to learn? Okay, this is what I want to say in Klingon. Raj is a strong warrior that can withstand a battle. Shuvwe hom mach Raj. My shuvrup be. What? I, I I need, need more, more practice. practice. Raj. <laughs> Raj, take it down a notch. Uh, do you mind if I talk to Lily for just a moment? Sure, Bass. Lily, my Klingon is not the best, but did you just teach our Android assistant to say, Raj is but a little warrior unable to hold a battle? <laughs> Relax, BK. I don't think he'll learn it right away. Plus, Raj is still like a child. Once he gets artificially excited about something else, he'll forget about wanting to learn Klingon completely. I guess that's true, Lily. Anyways, we want to get to our Star Trek news segment. Lily, you wanted to share with the viewers, our Trekkies, our high-level quick rundown of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Yes, BK, and with no spoilers. Star Trek Strange New Worlds has just premiered, and what I can tell you about it without giving away too much is that the show is a prequel to Star Trek the original series. It takes place 10 years before TOS with Captain Pike, First Officer Una Chin Riley, and Science Officer Spock. And what we learn is that the USS Enterprise will be at a new planet each episode. According to showrunner Henry Alonzo Myers, each episode will be unique and each of them will be different genres. Star Trek Strange New Worlds is set to be shown how the original creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, wanted to tell the story originally. However, NBC rejected the first idea because they thought that the pilot they made, the original one, was too cerebral for its audience. You can catch brand new episodes of Star Trek Strange New Worlds on Paramount+. Plus. Wow, I can't wait for the second episode. You know, to me it's fascinating that they're trying to tell the original story through the eyes of Gene Roddenberry. Hopefully, they can do it justice in the self-contained episodes like in Star Trek the original series back in the 1960s. I completely agree, VK. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. We are excited to introduce you to today's guest. He has over 100 feature films and 40 television productions under his belt. And has won seven Emmys! Well, let's welcome our guest for today's show, 
For 18 years, he was the special effects coordinator for Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. Now, he invented the Klingon warrior martial arts and the Klingon weapons, many of them. He's been nominated 19 times for an Emmy Award, and he won seven of them. We have Dan Curry with us here on a Captain's Log. We are excited to introduce you here as a guest, but Dan, for me in particular, it is such an honor to speak with you. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Kind of fun to share some uh, stories and uh, memories of uh, working on the show. So before we ask you about your fantastic career in the Hollywood film industry, I believe there were some life experiences that helped you get to where you are with your career. For instance, we found out that after you received your bachelor's from Middlebury College, you made the decision to join the Peace Corps and were subsequently sent to Thailand. That's super cool. Can you talk about that experience with us? Yeah, uh, well, I was um, eager to do something to, um, to serve after, after college and uh, uh, working in the, in the cause of peace seemed like a good option. And with poetic justice, I was sent right to the banks of the Mekong River. And um, I worked for the Thai Community Development Department and my job was to design and build um, small dams and bridges on little tributaries of the Mekong River. And uh, how it worked is the village would apply for a project, then the Thai government would approve it and provide the building materials, the villagers would provide the labor, and then I would go out, survey, um, design whatever the construction project was, then have it approved by engineers at uh, Konkan University. And then I would go back out to the village and uh, stay there uh, working with the villagers until the project was done. So I got to live in really remote areas uh, that didn't have electricity and was blessed with having the opportunity to experience uh, traditional Thai culture before TVs ar arrived and changed everything. What an amazing story. What I learned, though, was that despite, by, say, American terms, the villagers might not have a formal education as we know it, their wisdom, their ability to live in their environment, the beauty of their lifestyle, uh, food. And that's also where I began my study of martial arts, because for many, many generations, probably going back hundreds of years, each village had its own kind of secret martial arts style. And the... Uh, and every afternoon before dinner, some of the villagers would get together and they'd kind of train and there was always a village master and they were kind to the clumsy barbarian and uh, were willing to share some of their, their techniques with me, which all became part of the Klingon martial arts style years later. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's tremendous. <laughs> this clumsy Cyclops. Give us more context on what this means and how this all came about in Thailand. Okay. I'm referring to myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's what I thought. And uh, because the villagers, they would start studying when they were toddlers. So by the time they were 15 or 16, they were unbelievable. And I had friends who could go straight fingered into a watermelon. Um, and I had one teacher who was so good at iron palm you could take a pile of bricks and point to one halfway down and that would be the only brick that would break. He knew how to control the force of his blows. And so each village I went to, they had a slightly different style. And uh, that's uh, then years later, when I moved to Bangkok, I had uh, uh, the opportunity to study Taekwondo with uh, Kim Myung Su, who was rated number five in Korea. And then in, in Laos, I had a dagger teacher who was absolutely remarkable. And he would take us down to his friend's restaurant in one of the markets. And we'd practice slicing up sides of beef so we could feel how a knife can move through meat without snagging. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I worked in Laos for a while. Then I moved to Bangkok and directed a Thai language television series. And... Uh, did art and architecture jobs uh, on the side. I designed a what became a famous nightclub. And the highlight was when I won the competition to be the production designer on the King's Royal Ball one year. Wow, really? A warp speed on this interview with Dan Curry here on A Captain's Log. More to come. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. 
Trekkies, thank you for joining us here on a Captain's Log. Ah Warrior's blood runs through my veins. Yasha Teo Dan, you alluded to a Thai language television series. Can you please tell our viewers more about this? A kind vagabond magician who would go around helping children. And it was a, a children's series, kind of like a Sesame Street like like series. And so he could wave his chopsticks and letters would fly out of the books. And and uh, uh, I built a an animation stand out of wood and did all paper animation like Monty Python uh, because we had no money. And but it was fun. I made pup puppets and the little kind of dragon hand puppets that could talk to each other. And that was something we later used on Star Trek as well. Really? The, the puppetry that was derived yeah. from? That's amazing. Now, technology has really taken a lot away from prop making and really changed the way special effects are in Hollywood. Can you speak to that and what it's like now working with some of the more recent shows that you have done visual effects and special effects for? Well, it's never really gone, but it's certainly been overshadowed. And because the tools they have today are so much better and are able to create a level of verisimilitude that is, uh, uh, you know, if you can imagine it, you can make a convincing uh, visual presentation of it. And should comment on the difference between special effects and visual effects. Mm -hmm. Special effects, uh, the, our department is run by Dick Brownfield, and they do the pyro, the wire gags, anything with water, open fire. And we work together a lot when we blow up spaceships. They would um, uh, do all the pyro work, and then we would shoot it. Um, and uh, visual effects suggest that uh, different elements cr created or photographed separately are recombined or composited into a new c cinematic reality. And that's visual effects versus their kind of uh, colleagues, but not the same. So Dan, I have to ask, when you stayed in Asia and learned martial arts, did those studies help you develop the Klingon martial arts? Also, did the Asian style of martial arts you learned help you and get you the inspiration that you needed to design some of these Klingon weapons? Please go into the ergonomics and details of these weapons. Of course, um, and the uh, I, I'd always been imagining the batleth, which is kind of inspired by a small hand weapon, uh, a Chinese fighting crescent, usually used in pairs. And I remember imagining that, wow, if that was the size of a quarter staff and very symmetrical, and you could do all sorts of twirls with glissades, and it had uh, convenient decapitation flanges. Um, <laughs> Uh, that that kind of came from that. And uh, then uh, one story I could tell is the how uh, the Klingon Mechleth came into existence. And Michael Dorn, uh, of course, uh, everybody knows uh, the great actor who portrays Worf, um, when he signed on to Deep Space Nine, I got a phone call from Michael and it was Daniel, I need a new weapon. And so Michael came over to my house and uh, he, uh, I showed him uh, through my collection of, of weapons and uh, let me transport myself to another location so we can, I could show you these things. And uh, so I showed Michael, all that hardware. So I showed Michael this, which is, I obtained this in Western Nepal. This is a Nepalese Kora sword. And the sharp part is down. And unlike say a Western uh, cavalry sword, which is curved up, uh, these are curved down as they create uh, horrible lopping abilities. And then there's a little uh, knob on the end here, which uh, I guess you can see that easier there. Uh, for pounding people out of trying to pull you off your pony. So Michael liked this, and I said, well, let's use the front end. So Michael and I, uh, so I traced the front end of that, 
And then Michael and I talked about different things. We wanted something small enough that he could hide behind his back that you could use forehand and backhand and it had cutting surfaces everywhere. You could grapple an opponent's weapon. If you hold it down and block a weapon, it will guide your opponent's weapon away from you. And uh, so that's this. And then this is the... the metal version of that. There it is. Yes, I recognize it for sure. And uh, you can also throw it like a tomahawk and it works really well. <laughs> And I happen to have Batleth number one right here. You're holding the very first Batleth, the very first Klingon Batleth weapon. That's amazing. Yes. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And I'll show one more weapon I have handy. And uh, I this, it. we didn't use much, but I think this is uh egotistically speaking one of the best fighting knives ever designed yeah. and this was inspired by a um, malaysian chris also popular in indonesia and it's got a fuller to lubricate uh the blade for extractions and it breaks the seal from the uh the the spasms of the rectus abdominis plate wow. and you can grapple and also backhand uh hold this so you can use saber grip hammer grip, uh, and even a palm assisted thrust. Wow. And it'll also work a backhand. And this thick part of the, uh, the hilt uh, allows you to block without the sharp part coming into your arm. It's amazing. There's so much versatility built in just to one weapon alone. Wow, Dan, you really thought out the versatility of these weapons and made it possible for the actors to have multiple positions and ways to use them. Please tell us more. This one, of course, was reinforced with popsicle sticks. And Michael and I went out in my backyard and fooled around with it for a while. And for the, uh, the fighting scenes where the actors actually encounter each other, we had these thin steel lined rubber versions so they could whack at each other without uh, inflicting serious bodily harm. Wow. Oh. Even looking at that on this camera, it still looks like it's metallic and it looks like it's the real weapon. That's amazing. So that's so, that that is a, 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 like a rubbery, like a hard rubber to where you could hit someone with it and it wouldn't even hurt. Uh, well, it would hurt, but it would, would uh, but uh, it wouldn't uh, break the skin. And uh, one of Dennis Madelone, our stunt coordinator's uh, philosophy is no one gets hurt. <laughs> lots of prep i'm sure as well coordinating the stunts uh, to go along with your weapon design too that's awesome yeah we, we always had great fun and so uh i was uh blessed to uh it's funny when i first showed the bat left to dennis um uh, we had an episode where wharf was to inherit a traditional klingon bladed weapon and the art department had sent down something that looked like a pirate's cutlass. And I looked at it and said, eh, um, let's do something unique, but ergonomically sound for the Klingons that doesn't exist on earth, but uh, suits their warrior philosophy. So I came up with the Batleth and made a foam core one and showed it to Rick Berman, who of course said, well, if it was two inches shorter, it'd be acceptable. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, I showed it to Dennis. He said, I can't use that. And then I demonstrated some of the moves I had in mind for it. And, and he said, oh, that's cool. And so Dennis uh, became one of the evangelists of the bat left. And uh, uh, another uh, stunt guy on the show, Tommy Morga, became one of the great bat left masters. We have an amazing picture, actually. I'm going to pop it up, too, where you can see Dennis taking your bat left. He's like bending backward going through a stunt coordination. It's one of the most amazing just behind the scenes photos that I've ever seen. So Dan, let me ask you, in the second season Star Trek The Next Generation episode titled Where Silence Has Lease, there's a holodeck scene with Worf. Can you tell us a little bit more, elaborate on the special effects and even the Klingon bat left weapon that Worf used in that episode? Was that the first time we saw it? Or I'm not premiered? sure which was the first one that appeared in, you know, done so many episodes. <laughs> 
but I don't think he had it in the first season. I, I don't. I don't think it was where Silence has. It was one where Worf inher- inherits this weapon, you know, from the Mog family. But uh, that one, that that move in where Silence has lease, where, where he's in the holodeck at the skull creature, and he does that cut. That's yes. uh, well. That's that's a classic cut from the Tokugawa period of uh, samurai lore in in Japan, really? and they would t- to test a new blade. They would sometimes take a condemned prisoner and have him pose in a certain way, and the cut would go halfway between the shoulder and the neck, bisect the left nipple and exit. And then the top uh, portion of the body would slide off at that angle, which is what we reproduced in the show. Yes. I distinctly remember that. That's uh, one of the greatest wharf or especially early wharf uh, battle scenes. Awesome. And the writers picked up on uh, uh, Michael was so great at portraying wharf with his incredible gravitas that they started adjusting Klingon culture to be more Bushido-like, more kind of honor, honorable warriors, rather than in the original series where the uh, Klingons were kind of growling uh, uh, Bolsheviks. <laughs> in your book, you thank Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, executive producer Rick Berman, and supervising producer Peter Lauritsen for trusting you to help create for the franchise. Can you share a bit about your experience working with them? Well, how I started on Star Trek is Peter Lauritsen, uh, prior to joining Star Trek, was the vice president of Paramount Pictures in charge of television post-production. And because of that, and in the days when I also did a lot of title sequences, I'd worked with Peter on a number of projects. And we became friends and also um, had great trust for each other uh, professionally. And so I got a call from Peter and he said, hey, they're thinking about bringing back Star Trek. Uh, Would you be interested in helping us out and do a couple of some storyboards for us on the side? And I said, "Okay." And at the time I worked for Cinema Research, I was uh, vice president, director of creative services. And uh, so went over, met Gene and Peter. Gene talked about his vision for it. And the original idea was uh, ILM would do 40 stock shots that would serve the whole series of flybys entering orbit, leaving orbit. And that lasted about a week into the pilot. It lasted a week? You didn't have enough shots because you want to see more unique angles, right? Is, is... Uh, well, not only with the ships, but uh, and Rob Legato was... Uh, visual effects supervisor on the pilot and they quickly learned they needed more help so rob and i developed a a system of alternating episodes so rob working with gary hutzel was one team and me working with ronald b more uh, was the other team and uh, that's uh, and it made it a lot easier that way one team can be doing uh post-production while the other team was on set and then when the next episode went, then uh, it just made everything move more efficiently. And we had a, a a great person between us, the visual effects associate, David Takamura, who made sure that we were all on schedule and didn't get in each other's way. <laughs> a Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. There's so much more in store in our interview with Dan Curry. Dan, you referred to this a bit earlier. So you were asked to do the next gen pilot encounter at Farpoint. Uh, right. And so I was probably uh, one of the first people uh, that they hired to do those storyboards. And I looked at some sketches of Andy Probert's design for the Enterprise 1701D. And uh, so I uh, did, uh, that's how I was able to storyboard the those 40 stock shots, which we did shoot, by the way, and used for years. Absolutely. I can definitely see them in my sleep. I've seen them so many times and in so many different ways. So, Dan, you joined Star Trek The Next Generation, and everyone realized 
that Next Generation was going to have to be way different from the original 1960s Star Trek series. Tell us the very first episode you joined during season one. So I joined probably a couple of weeks into the pilot. You did? Okay. So you said you worked on Encounter at Farpoint, the pilot, but you had not stepped away from your previous role. I had left cinema research and, and joined the team at Star Trek. And I was getting uh, more and more interested in focusing on visual effects and less on title sequences. Although on Star Trek, I did design the title sequence for Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Amazing. Dan, can you tell us the distinct difference between the B-roll, specifically the space shots that you're shooting weeks in advance, as you alluded to earlier, and also those matte painting shots? Uh, I'd like to understand the whole process. Yeah, well, any space shot uh, would be uh, photographed with a physical model at Image G, which had a wonderful motion control system. And a motion control system is like a giant I-beam on its side and the camera was on a tower that, and it could go up and down, back and forth and in and out. So all the motion, uh, the ships could roll, pitch and yaw, but they didn't go back and forth. And that way we only had to light one place. And a typical simple flyby of the Enterprise required shooting it a minimum of seven times, doing exactly the same thing, but under a different lighting situation. So for example, we had shoot the beauty pass or the, the light on the hull. Then you'd shoot the warp drive, which we put a diffusion filter on to make the light glow or the deflector shield. The windows required separate exposures because each one required a different length of time per, sh per frame to capture the light. And so then uh, the most important one would be the mat pass where you'd shoot a silhouette of the ship. And originally we shot the unlit ship against white cards, but because the white cards were at different angles, we'd get an uneven black and white field for the, to make the, the mat or the, the silhouette of the ship to punch a hole in the background to put the model in. And uh, then Gary Hutzel came up with the idea of shooting um, day glow orange background with ultraviolet light. And so it was much more even and saved us an immense amount of time shooting the miniature ships. So those didn't happen on, uh, on the Paramount uh, lot. And then the compositing uh, first season was primarily at uh, the post group where we had special edit bays set up and we worked with brilliant compositor Fred Raimondi, who was interesting for me because I came from the world of optical printers doing everything with film photochemical processes. And when we started Next Generation, Paramount made a very courageous decision to not require a film negative as the final master. Oh. And that allowed uh, them to do such a high volume of visual effects at, at acceptable quality levels uh, in, the, in the time we had. It would take about seven weeks to create a single episode from starting first day of shooting to delivery date. Wow, seven weeks in advance? That's incredible. So you really had to get a lot shot in advance for the space shots and all the other B-roll before the episode goes into the post-production process. Tell us a little bit more how this works. Seven weeks. So uh, it would take uh, seven, usually seven shoot days of first unit. Then there would be a second unit day to do the highly technical shots that would be too time consuming, like blue screen. Shooting the motion control could take weeks. We were no strangers to 80 hour weeks to get everything done. <laughs> okay, Dan, this is a very precise question. <laughs> These space visual effects shots take a long time, as you alluded to. So right after the Gene Roddenberry title credit sequence pops up near the end of Next Gen, we see the Enterprise flying straight on. However, there's a tiny person visible in the window of 10 forward walking laterally while the ship moves. Was this a challenging visual effects shot? 
can you tell us how it all came together? Yeah, that was they were uh, called pin block people, where we actually shot pieces of film, uh, and it, that were in little uh, mounts that were per perfectly registered. So yeah, that wouldn't have to do it that way anymore. But that was that's why we only did one or two shots like that because they they took an incredible amount of time for just a few seconds of screen time. Dan, can you explain the special effects you processed and how your team went through the whole process from beginning to end on Star Trek The Next Generation for beginners? We also had uh, the motion control camera team at Image G. Uh, we also had the great model makers, not only uh, the, the models we got from ILM, uh, but we had uh, Greg Jean and Tony Meininger, who were phenomenal model makers. And we used other model makers as well, uh, Brick Price at Wonderworks and Don Pennington. But uh, Tony and Greg were the, the principal model makers we used all the time and just uh, excellent people and, and uh, among the best in the history of Hollywood. Then we had uh, animation and that would be done frame by frame by hand uh, by an animator electronically we started with the post group, then we used companies like Dig Digital Magic, Muse Effects, Eden Effects. They would put the ship shots together. CIS, uh, Composite Image Systems, had the only pin registered transfer system in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. And unlike most film to video transfer systems, which had rubber wheels, which the frames would never perfectly align, CIS had a system where they used uh, mechanical sprocket mechanisms from a movie camera in their transfer mechanism. So each frame was perfectly aligned. So all the elements, the lights and the warp drive and the silhouettes would all register perfectly. And uh, then we, when we would shoot the star fields as with the background, we would use the same pan tilt information uh, as the, the the camera shot as the ship shot, but we wouldn't use the track information. And that way, the stars would move in the background perfectly re uh, aligned with the ship. And we had a, a, a 180 degree psych uh, that was painted black inside and. Gary Hutzel went in with a push pin and scratched all the stars in it. And we just lit that from the back. And that's how the star fields were made. And for nebulas, we would use liquid nitrogen. Sometimes I'd use something like this thrown out of focus. This, by the way, is the force field that surrounds the Enterprise. We just wrapped it around a virtual m and when we moved into CG, uh, we started using um, vision art and uh, we would do hybrid work on CG that we didn't quite like the look of the, the ships yet. So for where we had lots of ships in the shot, the background ships would be CG and the foreground ships would be physical models. Knowing that people would be watching the, the ones in front that were highly detailed. And then as CG got better and better, uh, we used um, uh, uh, Foundation Imaging, who one of the pioneers, as well as um, uh, J John Gross's company, Amblin Imaging, and uh, and they were doing Sequest at the time, and uh, Foundation was doing Babylon Five, and so we kind of grudgingly started using CG because we. It didn't have time to shoot more than a few ships per uh, per week. Absolutely, yeah, I could see that, uh, especially with your seven week lead time, right? Um, yeah, and <laughs> and for a simple flyby would take all day, and uh, if it was a complicated thing with extra interactive lights, such as uh, a nearby explosion, and sometimes we would cover the model with black uh, aluminum foil and then cover it with. Um, with uh, steel wool spread out and then light the steel wool with a match and it would uh, the oil on the wool would burn in interesting fiery patterns that would radiate out and we'd use that as the reaction for a phaser hit 
Wow. And then that's what was used throughout the series as the phaser hit then for the most part. Yeah, it would vary. And this would also be a phaser hit for Spallman. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, what is the matte painter artist that you worked with specifically on Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, all the other series? Matte paintings, we used uh, uh, Sid Dutton at Illusion Arts would do uh, matte paintings when we had the time and budget. And otherwise I would do them. Really? You would do them yourself? Yeah. Oh, wow. You and Sid Dutton did most of the matte paintings. Tell us your favorite memory, and specifically, which was one of your favorite matte paintings that you did for any of the Star Trek series? That I had to do. Yeah. Um, that I out. might have done one of the earliest uh, electronic matte paintings on a paint box, and that was for uh, The Inner Light, where we see Captain Picard standing on a cliff and you see an alien village. That was the first um, complex uh, electronic matte painting I did, and it's one of the earliest ones. Um, and uh, so I covered up where the Hollywood sign was and <laughs> replaced it with an alien village inspired by kind of Greek architecture. That's so cool. And Sid is uh, just such a, a master painter, and sometimes we'd be working on a shot and we'd pass the paintbrush back and forth. And uh, my one of my favorite shots that Sid did was the um, uh, interior of the Borg Cube for Q Who. Oh, yes. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that all came about? That's one yeah, almost that everyone's a big, favorite. Uh, a big painting, probably about eight feet by eight feet. And then Sid's partner, uh, the late Bill Taylor, also a genius, cut a hole in the painting that was on Masonite and rear projected the partial set we had on stage. And then as the camera would back up on its motion control track, every once in a while, Bill would stop the camera and build a little network of, of structures out of um, legions of power toy construction <laughs> set. And so that as the camera pulled back, you felt like different structural objects were going by you and uh, to give it a, a better sense of verisimilitude and you're in the space. And uh, interestingly enough, when we redid uh, Uprezed Next Generation for Blu-ray, we redid that shot and we decided to do that digitally. And the artist who was working on it did a very reverential job in recreating Sid's painting. But because we had access to newer tools, we could make things move that couldn't move before and make water shimmer in a trough down below. and. Uh, but uh, that was one, and here's another one of Sid's, which is... Oh, yes. Yeah, it's the Cardassian homeworld. Yeah, and uh, and if you notice that Sid, that hook on the building we wanted to do to uh, reflect the arcs on the uh, Deep Space Nine uh, station. Oh, yes, I do. I recognize the similarity. That's awesome. Yeah, and here's that. You can see... See what I'm talking about. Aha. Uh -huh. Very familiar. Yes. I like the comparison. A captain's log returns in a moment. Welcome, Welcome back, back to, to a captain's log. log. Now, more, more of our, our interview with Dan. Dan. From my understanding, you designed main title sequences. Dan started his Star Trek adventure designing the title credits for Star Trek IV. Uh, that was my first Star Trek uh, project. And, um, the producer, Ralph Winter, called me up and said, hey, would you do a title sequence for a new Star Trek movie? And I said, okay. And that's kind of how that came about. And the thing I did that was uh, cool at the time was uh, had the main title beam in. Yes, I remember it. The title card beam in. Yes. It like split, essentially. Yeah. With the effects, yes. And I, I did... Uh, 118 feature title sequences. <laughs> and those would include Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Top Gun. Um, my, one of my favorites, Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield. Um, uh, Three Amigos. Uh, uh, another favorite, uh, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, directed by the great Carl Reiner. And uh, A Man with Two Brains, another Carl Reiner, Steve Martin collaboration. So yeah, I had a, it was fun. I had a great time and everything was really primitive. We would actually set type by hand and 
Um, and there was one precursor to some of the, the title sequences, and you, I think you can find it online. There's a Paramount miniseries called Space based on a James A. Michener novel starring James Garner. And I did the title sequence for that, um, shooting everything on a down shooter, uh, like an animation stand where there's a camera that points straight down onto a life ta light table. And I had star fields that were paint sprit spritz with an old toothbrush um, and old posters. And some of the nebulas were just uh, kind of uh, uh, wound up nylon stockings with raking light on them. So you just saw little ridges, but everything was very primitive by today's standards. It was kind of medieval alchemy. <laughs> but it worked and it worked so well. Did you know, or did you have a feeling that Star Trek was going to be as popular as it was from when it was just starting out as Star Trek, the original series? Uh, nobody knew. It was uh, uh, uncharted territory and everybody uh, wasn't sure it would catch on. And uh, I think a lot of the success of the next generation, of course, goes to Gene and his colleagues uh, in the writing department coming up with great stories. Uh, but the charisma of the cast and uh, Patrick Stewart, I'll never forget my first day on set. And I walked in and I said to the DP, I said, who's the captain? And he said, that bald guy over there. And it's like, the bald guy is the captain? And then Patrick delivered some lines, and I said, yeah, he's the captain. <laughs> <laughs> Very authoritative tone. Patrick Stewart has, yes. The Star Trek original series, they did everything in post-production with film using optical printers and compositing. And in today's industry, we have more high-tech productions in CGI and other visual effects. Can you uh, run through that process and what the differences were like between the original series and Star Trek The Next Generation, for example, in the mid 80s? The original series, uh, a lot of it was done by uh, Howard Anderson Company, and I knew Howard very well. And uh, uh, Linwood Dunn, who was the man who perfected the optical printer, uh, and he was so important to the industry uh, that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences named one of their theaters after him. Wow. And in small world, Lynn and my father knew each other as children in Brooklyn, New York. Really? All the way across the country? <laughs> it's crazy. And so for me, one of the the big jumps was moving into the, the video world. And at that time, we were using one-inch analog video compositing. All those machines are now forming the basis for, for coral reefs. <laughs> <laughs> The tools got better almost every year. The big breakthrough for us was when the format D5 came along. And with analog video compositing, every time you duped a generation, the image quality would suffer very much like with film, where you would say if you could do uh, as a kid, I could even spot when a dissolve was coming up because you'd see a sudden shifted grain in the background, you'd, oh, dissolve coming up. And, uh, but D5, uh, eliminated the need for uh, image degradation by duping. So you could dupe over and over again and build uh, pristine shots of many layers uh, without suffering uh, that image quality loss. So that was a big breakthrough for us. And then the other big breakthrough was uh, coming up with the Daglo orange backgrounds for map passes and then as CG got better and better, and uh, Star Trek Enterprise was the first all CG show we did. No models at all, really. Okay, so the beaming visual effect from the original Star Trek series into the next generation really didn't change uh, its base effect. However, in the next generation, we had like that dropping down of a beam that seemed to be added. Tell us the differences between the uh, visual effects of original series and next generation with the beaming process. Yeah, we called that the shower curtain. Um, and uh, it was pretty much the same, only the original series was done on an optical printer. Um, and uh, But there was also the rotoscoping step where you would trace the actor, then key or composite the sparkles through that silhouette. And when I did transporters, um, you know, being a finicky artist, I would, instead of just doing a, a flat silhouette, I would airbrush 
the actor kind of in low res, so it looked almost like a soft statue of the actor, so that the sparkle density would be greater in the center than on the edges, which gave it a little bit more of an illusion of three-dimensionality rather than a flat curtain. Dan, I know Brian and our producer Dustin have looked into your book of treasures. Please tell us Trekkies about your recent hardback book, Star Trek, The Artistry of Dan Curry. How the book came into existence is Ben Robinson, who later became my co-author on the book, invited me to join some other Star Trek luminaries on a panel at Comic-Con in San Diego. And we talked about our jobs on Star Trek. And by a coincidence, the head of CBS Publishing was in the audience. And after the talk, she came up and said, well, you have an interesting sense of humor and you did things in a weird way. Um, would you be interested in writing a book? And that's how it became. And then Ben became my co-author. So one of my goals with the book is to talk about the evolution of visual effects technology going from motion control and matte paintings done in oil to pure CG. I wanted to celebrate as many people as the publisher would allow in the book to talk about what they've done. The book also has a commentary by some of the cast and crew, Kate Mulgrew, Scott Bakula, Michael Dorn all have things to say about it. This is it. And this is all uh, uh, from artwork I, I did for the show. This act, this this was actually for a comic book cover I did. I always wanted to do one, and that was the only comic book cover I ever did. And uh, then these are different paintings. And so that's on the back, of course, the, the Batleth and some other stuff. And so I wanted to talk about uh, different elements like using liquid nitrogen. Here's a scene where uh, I wanted Riker to be pulled into another dimension. Uh, so instead of uh, putting the actor on wires or the stunt double on wires, I had this idea to use, uh, just have them jump in front of a, of a blue screen and tilt the camera at the appropriate angle sideways and shoot it at 350 frames a second. So it would look like he was very gently floating up off his bed and as much information as possible about different uh, people and what their contributions were to the show. So it's really a, a celebration of the visual effects team that uh, made it happen. And just coincidentally, my name's on the cover, <laughs> but it's really about everybody else. Dan, the last page you were showing is very memorable. I mean, who can forget Remick and the alien in his stomach getting his head exploded by Picard and Riker's phasers? Wow, it is amazing how you made these effects. Do you want to share how all of that came about? We had found an old mold of Paul Newman's head, and I knew I wanted to uh, blow up Remick's head. So Dick Brownfield packed it with raw meat, and uh, and then uh, Makeup Effects Lab, uh, Alan Apone's company, did the built that chair with the the thoracic cavity ripped open, and we packed that with. Uh, uh, little plastic parasites, cotton candy, and there were water spritzers built inside. <laughs> and Alan Sims, our prop master, was underneath reaching up through the uh, seat of the chair that the dummy was sitting in, kind of like a, an overzealous proctologist and uh, <laughs> with a hand puppet on. Then when his chest burns away, you see the beams of light coming out. Uh, we set up a smoke tent and got some black styrofoam and splashed uh, acetone on it, which ate away the styrofoam, and then the different lights coming through created those god rays coming out. And then when we finally blew up Remick's head, Riker and Picard come in, they shoot him in the face, and you see the active skin burning away, revealing raw meat, which then blows up. And the producers were a little concerned it might be a bit strong for Star Trek, and they said, uh, Dan, you, your son's about six, right? And I said, yeah. Uh, would you mind him seeing this? And I said, nah. And so he goes into the mixing sound mixing room and the big screen up. And it, so my son Devin is watching the, the show. And then they knew that scene was coming up and they all turned to watch him. And he watched it calmly. And they said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, I think you should make an action figure that when you press the button, uh, Remick's head blows up. And they said, well, I guess... Uh, not so bad. 
And uh, I neglected to tell him that he was with me when I visited Makeup Effects Lab and he saw how everything was done. So it wasn't horrific for him, but we got tsunamis of mail from concerned parents who uh, were upset that such a graphic gore was depicted. <laughs> so cool. In Star Trek Enterprise, the Scott Bakula series, can you share with us the one episode where you didn't do the, the visual effects and who did you hand it off to? On Enterprise, I personally designed every, uh, all but one CG creature. Well, I did some rough designs and then passed it off to Steve Berg to do the, the finish work on it. And the tripod creature species 8472. Yeah. Uh, that actually came from uh, uh, my theater thesis project in grad school, where I did a play. Each audience member was given a little floral poncho, and they sat in these pits, and they saw on, on the set what looked like a, uh, a machine with a silver Carmen Miranda on it and a statue that looked like it made out of uh, lava. And, one, and this creepy electronic music I created for it. And then... <laughs> When the audience is finally settled, the uh, statue starts to move and welcomes the audience uh, as if as semi-sentient photosynthetic organisms uh, the, in beds of like hydroponic plants. And they had a collective consciousness, uh, which is basically what the audience is. And it gave the actors an excuse to talk to them. And they were uh, and it was set in an alien prison. And the inciting incident is a new prisoner arrives and something goes wrong on the planet, which you can see in the distance. So the uh, the uh, sociopathic characters are free to revert to their bad behavior and they have to form alliances. And uh, one of the ideas I had from watching uh, Chinese opera in remote villages is I planted a dummy in the audience uh, at, next to a guy who was a friend of mine that had a removable head and I put a bellows attached to it with uh, uh, red glitter. So one of the evil characters reaches down and pulls the head up and then the bellows shoots the red <laughs> glitter up into the air, which for that one instant, the audience is horrified. <laughs> and uh, which was your one intention. Of the, <laughs> uh, one of the characters was a comedic character, which was a tripod creature. And uh and I devised this cane that the actor could use. It, and the audience couldn't tell which was the bogus leg because he did a good job performing it. And uh, But instead of being a, a funny character, uh, I, 8472 became this really scary hunter uh, species. Yeah, I mean, you have to be extremely scary to, to get into the Borg's head. The Borg were supposedly for years undefeatable. That's really cool yeah, how they were inspired. That's an amazing story. And by the way, the when you see the pile of dead Borg that the actors walk around in, mm -hmm. I took a Borg action figures and they were so well made and so detailed that I cut them up with a Dremel and just built that little pile of Borg parts and told the actors where it would be on the set so they knew where to look and how high it would be. Whoever sculpted the action figures did such a good job, I could even do close-ups on it. That's so cool. You always said we and took the spotlight off of yourself, redirecting it to the people that you work with. Can you share with us some of these people you work specifically with on the Star Trek series and how important were they to you? As I said in the book, uh, no single hero of Star Trek visual effects, it's a team sport. And it requires an, a, an immense amount of people with different skill sets, all working toward the common goal of creating the universe for these Star Trek stories to unfold in. Dan Curry, you are a treasure to the Trek world. This was so much fun listening to your stories and learning how we can see special effects and your creations in a different light. Trekkies, there's so much more in store for you Star Trek fans here on A Captain's Log. Lily and I want to thank you so much for trekking through the stars of Star Trek Hollywood and Toronto via our interviews and hope you'll enjoy our episodes next season, season three. We'll be back for more. We were blessed to have Dan Curry send us out with a bang. Remember, there's always new Star Trek on Paramount+. Plus. Star Trek Strange New Worlds will be followed by new episodes of Lower Decks this summer. Hello. You've manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Ooh.